Steve, well, it's uh, my great privilege at this point in the service to explain as simply as I can and as clearly as I can the message of Christmas. And uh, this year I've chosen just one verse from the Bible to help me do it. Uh, It was on the handout you should have received when you came in. You might like to just have it in front of you. And uh, as we begin, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Lord, we know we're living in a dark world. How much we need your light. Shine it into our hearts, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Do please put your nose on it. Uh, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I'm not very good with keys. Um, I lose them frequently and easily. Uh, At home we have two large boxes of keys, and uh, if you ask me what any of them are for, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, Just recently, we've had a succession of overseas visitors staying with us, and whenever people come to stay, we want to give them a spare key so that uh, if they come back after we've all gone to bed, they can let themselves in and not find themselves locked out, which, of course, is tiresome for everybody. Now, in exactly the same way, there is a key for the New Testament, and I wonder if you knew that. Um, And without it, the New Testament is locked and bolted and we stand outside wasting our time feeling thoroughly frustrated. Maybe that's been your experience and if it has, it's because until now you haven't had the key. Well, the key to the New Testament is the word grace. Uh, Jim Jim Packer is perhaps the greatest Uh, Bible scholar alive today and he says this grace is the key that unlocks the New Testament and it is the only key that does so, it is the key word and uh, the New Testament is all about grace God is the God of grace the gospel is the gospel of grace and when you read the various letters of the New Testament you find that uh, instead of beginning by saying, dear so-and-so, the writers nearly always begin by saying, grace to you, and instead of ending by saying, kind regards, or yours sincerely, or whatever it is, they say, grace to you. And um, grace, therefore, is the key to the New Testament. It is the key to understanding the work of Christ, and to miss it, or to misunderstand it, is to be locked outside. And that, of course, is why so many people today uh, are in a spiritual pothole. They make no forward progress in Christianity. Some of them, I guess, are in the pothole of confusion. Uh, They come to church occasionally, maybe to a service like this. Uh, The music is enjoyable. The people are pleasant. But the message from the pulpit means absolutely nothing because they don't have the key. That's the problem. They're locked outside because they don't understand grace. Uh, They see other people singing and they see that they're enjoying themselves, but they say, well, you know what? I'm locked outside. I just don't get it. Then other people, of course, are in the pothole of religion. There is a, a formality in their spiritual life, but it's just a shell. It's rather like the religion of my school days, uh, which means, of course, their church going is boring, inherited, external, static, mechanical, and thoroughly undemanding. Uh, Victor Hugo described grace like this, God's grace. He says, life's greatest happiness is to be convinced that you are loved. And I have to say that in ten years of school chapel, I knew maybe just a tiny handful of men who were convinced of that. The majority hardly believed it. But that is the message. Most people never find the key. Other people then, of course, are in the pothole of moralism. Uh, They say, well, I'm doing my best. I try to live a decent life. 
and ultimately I'll arrive at the gates of heaven and I'll rescue myself. So these people, you see, relate to God entirely through their own performance rather than through Jesus Christ. Uh, Maybe there's someone in this room this morning and you can say, yes, that is me. Um, Are you trying to get to heaven through your own performance and not his? You see, for people like that, uh, Christmas is about God coming to reward their goodness rather than dealing with their sin and their rebellion. So think of Santa Claus in the Christmas grotto. Um, A little boy comes in and uh, Santa says, have you been a good boy? And the little boy lies and says, yes. And Santa says, well, here's your Christmas present. And that's, you see, how these people think about Almighty God. They think that at Christmas, God comes to reward their goodness. Now, my friend, if that is your key to the message of the New Testament, can I urge you to throw it away? Because the key to understanding the New Testament is grace. And uh, the text for this morning is all about grace. Let's look at it together again. This is a terrific verse to memorise, treasure, cut it out, put it on your fridge. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now let's put this verse in its context because we can't simply rip it bleeding out of its New Testament context and impose, as it were, our own interpretation. In chapters 8 and 9 of this letter, uh, the Apostle is writing to Christians in Corinth uh, about a collection that he wants to take to the Christians in Jerusalem. Now that might sound rather uninteresting to us this morning, but it's actually extremely important Because if the Corinthian Christians, who are Greek, show their care and generosity to the Jerusalem Christians, who are Jewish, it will be a visible sign of the unity of God's church. And you see, friends, that was the great miracle that Christianity brought into the ancient world. But in Christian churches... Jews and Gentiles started loving one another. That hadn't happened before. And that was what turned the ancient world upside down. Now, can I say that lots of churches in Cape Town, I think you probably know this, are largely monocultural. But in the first century, the church was not like that. It was multicultural. It was not monocultural. People loved each other across the culture, across the age gap, across the race gap. And Paul knows just how important that is. It's got to be done. And uh, therefore, Paul is concerned in this letter that the Christians in Corinth, who had promised to send a financial gift the year before, actually make their promise good. Now, in light of that, I think it's absolutely fascinating that in chapters 8 and 9, he never ever uses the word money. Not once. He only ever uses the word grace. Because, you see, generosity is a work of grace. Generosity is a symptom of God's grace. So, show me a Christian in whom the grace of God is at work, and one of the signs will be an open wallet or an open purse. If they've got grace, they will be giving. And so, therefore, Paul, in chapters 8 and 9, talks about grace, and he doesn't talk about money. And then, as the supreme example of God's grace, he reminds them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're taking notes on the outline, you'll see there are two headings there. First of all, what happened? And second heading, why did it happen? So, first of all, what happened? What was the historical event? Well, you can see it in the second half of the verse. Have a look at it. He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So he was rich, but he became poor. That's what happened. What on earth does it mean? Well, it means that if we want to get to grips with who Jesus is and understand what he's done... 
We should not start with the Gospels and the New Testament letters. We've had some marvellous readings from the New Testament this morning. That's entirely appropriate. It's just not where the story of Jesus begins. We don't begin with the baby born in Bethlehem. No, what we should be doing is going back to the very beginning of our Bibles, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it is there that we first find Jesus Christ in the Bible. So he's not an afterthought, you see, in God's plan to save the world. He's right there at the very beginning. And he's intimately involved in the creation of the universe. So uh, one of the readings we'll have on Christmas Day is John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Let me remind you what it says. It says, in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And therefore, I say again that Jesus' personal existence did not begin as a baby in a stable in Bethlehem. He was already there at the very beginning of time. Uh, Colossians 1.16 tells us all things were created by him and for him. Now that means that he was the agent in God's creation, but it also means he was the recipient of that creation. In other words, if you think of it in modern terms, the title deeds of the universe were given to him. And that, you see, makes you and I his tenants. I wonder if you've thought about that. We're not the owners. I wonder how many of your friends know that. Bill Bryson is a, a rather amusing travel writer. Uh, he's an American, and he travels a great deal, and he writes rather wittily about his various travel experiences. This is an extract from a book called The Lost Continent, Travels in Small Time America. And uh, he's visiting the Grand Canyon, and this is what he says. Nothing prepares you for the Grand Canyon, no matter how many times you read about it or see it pictured. It literally takes your breath away. Your mind, unable to deal with anything on this scale, just shuts down. And for many long moments, you are a human vacuum without speech or breath, but just a deep, inexpressible awe that anything on this earth could be so vast, so beautiful, so silent. Even children are stilled by it. Well, that's a miracle. And then he talks about a visit that he made to the Grand Canyon 40 years after he'd been taken there by his parents. So he's retracing the steps of that childhood journey. But it's a dreadful anticlimax, uh, because he goes on a day when a, a blanket of fog has come down over the whole place. And he goes on to write this, I, I shuffled over cautiously and looked down but could see nothing but grey soup. Uh, a middle-aged couple came along and we stood chatting about what a disappointing experience this was. But then a miraculous thing happened. The fog lifted. It just silently drew back like a, theater, a set of theatre curtains being opened. And all of a sudden, we saw that we were on the edge of a sheer drop of at least a thousand feet. Jesus, we said, and jumped backwards. And all along the Grand Canyon, you could hear people saying, Jesus, like a message being passed down a long line. And then for many moments, all was silence except for the fretful shiftings of the snow, because out there in front of us was the most awesome but silencing sight that there is on planet Earth. Now, I wonder if you can see the irony there. Uh, the one who made the Grand Canyon, the one to whom it belongs, because that's what our verse means when it says he was rich, the one who made the Grand Canyon is actually treated as a swear word. You see, as the greatness of the Grand Canyon is revealed, people are so blind that they only use its owner's name as a swear word. It is a breathtaking blindness. Uh, every year, as I'm sure some of you know, Forbes magazine 
publishes a list of the richest people in the world. I haven't made it in there yet. As a clergyman, I'm not expecting to. But it tells you what these people earned last year and what their, where their assets are. And it gives the media something to write about for months afterwards because, let's face it, they haven't got much that's any use to say otherwise. And uh, what the Bible tells us is that compared to Jesus, everything that these people own is actually just a drop in the ocean. It's a speck in the universe because the reality is that Jesus owns the lot. Just think about that. It all belongs to him. The earth, the planets, the stars in their billions, they're all his. Verse 9, he was rich. All of creation is his. He created it. He's the rightful owner. And yet, the message of our verse is that though he was rich, for your sakes, for your sakes, for your sakes, He became poor. He gave it up. He laid it aside. Actually, that phrase translated literally is he impoverished himself. He became a beggar. So let's try and get our minds around this for just a moment. Let's uh, go back in time, 2,027 years. Uh, That's four years before the Lord Jesus was born. What was Jesus doing then? Well, he was enjoying the fullest and the finest and the richest fellowship with his father. Now the problem you and I have with that is we don't have the categories to describe it. As I said a bit earlier, we've just recently had a a steady stream of visitors staying with us in our home for our younger daughter's wedding. It's been marvellous taking them round and showing them the sights, all the usual things, at Table Mountain, Chapman's Peak, Camps Bay, Hermanus and so on. We, of course, know all of these places so terribly well that we take them for granted. What's been very special for us, though, is watching the reaction on the faces of family and friends when they see these things for the first time, especially in the uh, the sunshine, because if they've come from the UK, there is, of course, no sunshine, and uh, they think that Cape Town is paradise. And yet, and yet... However beautiful these places are, the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2. You see, that means that heaven is so amazing, we can't begin to describe it. And Jesus was enjoying it before he became a man. The most beautiful things on earth cannot begin to compare with what Jesus was enjoying at his father's side. And then he became poor. He laid aside that rich fellowship with the father. He entered Mary's womb. Now, can you imagine the angel Gabriel's reaction to all of this? I was thinking about that during the week. When God the Father told Gabriel to go and visit Mary, I can't help imagining Gabriel saying to Almighty God, Lord, with all due respect, we can do better than Nazareth. Mary is a a poor Palestinian girl living in Nazareth, which was the piss in Galilee. Nobody wanted to live there. No one in their right minds went anywhere near it. Mary was unmarried. She's from a working class family. She's got very little going for her. And I can just imagine Gabriel saying to God, Lord, for your son, we can do so much better than Nazareth. And then, of course, having been born in a stable, Jesus was immediately hated by the people who wanted him dead, even when he was just a tiny boy. I don't know whether you know this, but just after Christmas there is a festival in the church calendar called the Slaughter of the Innocents. It's on the 28th of December every year, and it's the day when the church remembers that Herod killed all the baby boys in Bethlehem. You can read about that in Matthew 2. So Jesus, you see, was pursued by those who wanted him dead. He grew up in a poor home. He began a travelling preaching ministry. 
He had no earthly support, no earthly comfort, no earthly security. And talking about himself in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus says, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Made the Grand Canyon, but he had nowhere to lay his head. He was rich, yet he became poor. And finally, of course, he was despised and denied by his closest friends. He was deserted. And um, his few possessions were snatched from him and gambled for in front of him as he was hanging and suffocating on that Roman cross. And he died a death which the Roman orator Cicero described as the most cruel and painful of all punishments. And one writer says, listen to this, Jesus was born in a borrowed manger, preached from a borrowed boat, entered Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey, ate the Last Supper in a borrowed room, and was buried in a borrowed tomb. So friends, think about this again. He was rich, but for your sakes, he became poor. Think about the cost of it. I know some of you are probably in touch with missionaries serving in other countries. Their lives are hard. It's very costly for them to do it. But think about this. See, when Jesus became a man, he opened himself up to things that he'd never experienced before. Temptation, pain, desertion, injustice, cruelty, mockery, rejection. And he felt the full force of Satan's hostility right from the beginning to the very end of his earthly ministry. And he knew exactly what it feels like to be deserted and without friends. And think about this. As a young boy, when he thought about where his life was heading and what the future might hold, he would open Isaiah 53 and he would read these verses about himself. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. You see, he totally identified with us, didn't he? You know, he didn't come down in a, in a space suit um, and walk on a red carpet, rather like uh, Harry and Meghan visiting Cape Town. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm delighted Harry and Meghan came to Cape Town. That was marvellous. But you see, when they visited South Africa, Harry and Meghan were very, very safe. Jesus was never safe. He went into the worst places. And just look in your mind at the step that he took. Because he went from the highest rung on the ladder, heaven, to the bottom rung of the ladder, hell. And he put himself under God's anger. And though he was innocent, he allowed the sword of God's wrath to fall into him on our behalf. And as he cried out in anguish, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was in the depths of poverty. And the point is, he didn't have to do it. It was grace. It was undeserved generosity. You see, did Jesus Christ have the right to heaven? He did. Did he have the right to glory? He did. Do we deserve our guilt? We do. Do we deserve our judgment? We do. We have no excuse as far as God is concerned. So Christ went from rich to poor and the reason was, at the start of our verse, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that little phrase, he was rich yet he became poor, there are some massive truths wrapped up. We find there the incarnation because Jesus became a man for us and we find the atonement. He became a dead man for us. He took on flesh. He took our punishment. That is what happened. That is history. Now I want to say something very serious to you now. Can I tell you that if your heart is hardened to this, if as I speak of this you don't really care, 
Can I say in love, you're in a very dangerous place. That is what happened. That is history. But secondly, why did it happen? Why did it happen? Why did Christ become poor? Well, look at our verse again, because part of the answer is in uh, the phrase, for your sakes, which in the original means for your need. In other words, Jesus saw that all of us have a need, that we might be aware of it, we might not be aware of it. Uh, So just imagine for a moment that a friend says to you, um, I'm terribly sorry, I I hear you smashed your car up this week, please take mine. Now you see, you might say to them, well that's very generous of you, but it's really totally unnecessary. But you see, if it really is necessary, and if we need a car because we've got a job to go to, and we've got real responsibilities, and we've got people that we need to visit, well we will say, that is exceptionally generous of you. Thank you very much. That is such a relief. I really, really need that. Now you see, friends, when we read that Jesus became a man and became a sacrifice for you and for me, what is our reaction? Do we say, well, that's very nice, but, you know, it's not really necessary? Or do we say, thank you very much. That is precisely what I need. Because, you see, Jesus is assuming it's that. You know, he saw us to be helpless and hopeless, or he would never have become a man, and he would never have gone to the cross. You see, if there was any other way for us to be rescued, God would have done it, don't you think? If God knew there was another way for us to be rescued apart from the cross, God would have chosen it. But, you see, he saw it to be necessary His son must become poor and pay in death and blood for our sin and rebellion or we will pay for our sin ourselves in hell in a place of eternal torment. And, you know, you've got to ask yourself this morning why I'm telling you that. Because I'm not telling you these things to be mean or to be judgmental. It's the truth. That is why he became poor. He became poor to pay for us. And you see, when it comes to needs, think about needs. You see, so many people have this kind of tough external layer of self-sufficiency, don't they? I'm sure you can think of people like that. There are going to be people that you meet this Christmas and uh, they will look happy and healthy. Uh, They will look normal, rational, sensible balanced, intelligent. Some of them might even be rich. But Jesus, you see, he looked down and he saw all these people looking healthy and happy, self-sufficient and satisfied, and he said, no! They do not know God. They're on borrowed time. They're making a name for themselves and a kingdom for themselves, but their kingdom is going to perish, and so will they. So for your sakes, he became poor. And at the end of the verse, he gives the reason. Can we see it at the end of the verse? That you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now what on earth does that mean? Well, for a start, it means rich in forgiveness, rich in a clear conscience before Almighty God. If you're anything like me, as you look back over your life over the past year, There are things you've said and done that you wish you hadn't. But if you're a Christian, your conscience is completely cleansed because it's been dealt with by Christ. That is what it means to be rich. Also, rich in friendship with God. You know, there are times when we feel very lonely. I do, I'm sure you do. But you see, I know that by his Spirit, Christ is with me. That is rich. Rich in God's strength to cope with each day. Some of you are going to be looking at the year ahead and you've got butterflies in your stomach because there are all kinds of uncertainties. You don't know how you're going to deal with them. But Christ is with you. And if you are a Christian, you are rich in his presence and you are rich in his strength. And also rich in the certainty of eternal life. 
Uh, I discovered something I didn't know this week. Um, But the Puritans um, used to take their young children to the deathbed of their Christian friends and family. And they said, watch this man die, watch that woman die, and see what you have got in Christ. Imagine doing that with the children at Sunday school. I think the parents would probably be reaching for the smelling salts. It's not a bad idea, I have to say. But what I want to say to you is that if you are not rich like this, the whole point of Jesus coming into the world at Christmas has eluded you. You are meant to be rich like this. This is the Christmas jackpot. And if you don't understand these riches, you have not yet found the key to your life. And if you turn your back on this, and that you give yourself to the pursuit of a name and a reputation and a kingdom for yourself, that is desperate poverty. Because the Lord Jesus himself said, if you gain the whole world and yet lose your soul, that is terrible, terrible poverty. Because it all belongs to him. Grand Canyon and all. But Paul says, for your sake, Jesus became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And all of that is undeserved generosity. Can you see the phrases in the verse? Let's drill it in. Have a look at it. Yet for your sakes, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And it's summed up, of course, at the start of the the verse, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that is the reason he became poor. And let's seal this, because in our core thinking, we don't have this in place. It is not that we deserved it. It is not that we were so lovable. It is not that we have so much potential. It is that he was gracious. And it's because a fountain of undeserved generosity lay in the heart of Jesus Christ for me and for you. And it is undeserved, it is unrepayable, and it is unconditional. And it was there in his heart for me. Let, let me remind you what Victor Hugo said. Life's greatest happiness is to be convinced that you are loved. And God looks around the world this morning and he sees people as either rich or poor, and the rich is come from Christ and nowhere else. Well, I must conclude. And of course the question is this. What is our response to God's generous grace? Well, my friend, if you're poor, and uh, if you don't have a day-to-day relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you are poor. If you are self-reliant, trusting in your own spiritual performance, then you are poverty-stricken. And you, if you don't do anything about that, you will perish. And I urge you to think very carefully about your life here on this earth because it's very short and it's soon going to be over. And I want you to see this morning that Christ became poor for your sake so that you might become rich in forgiveness, rich in friendship with God, rich in eternal life because those are the gifts of Christmas. That is the Christmas jackpot. And our verse calls all those who are poor whether they feel like it or not, to come to Christ and take his riches. Now, you can do that immediately after this service because some of the team are going to be standing at the back of the church. You can go and talk to one of them and they'll be happy to pray with you and lead you to Jesus this morning. Alternatively, you might have questions. That's a good thing. It's good to have questions. If that is you, why don't you join us on Wednesday evening at our home at 7 o'clock for an event we're calling Any Questions. Um, On the table in front of you, you'll find us a piece of paper, and you can write your name and give us your contact information, and write down the specific questions you would like answered. Hand the piece of paper in, I'll do my best to answer them on Wednesday night. But lastly, what does this verse say to those of us who are already rich with the riches of Christ? Well, you see, Paul was calling on the Corinthian Christians 
to be generous with their money. And that is one response. It's actually the one that the Corinthians have forgotten. Have you? That as we grasp grace, we give. See, not all of us can do that, and that's fine, but some of us can. And if you can, but you're not, well, this verse is a verse for you. But even more important than that, this verse is calling every Christian to be thankful. That's actually the only application I want to leave with you this morning. Be thankful. You see, the New Testament says that people who've been converted to Christ are thankful to God. Well, it's mid-November. Is it too early for a New Year's resolution, I wonder? Perhaps you already have one. My New Year's resolution is that I want to be more thankful to God for his grace. Every day in my prayers, I want to be thanking God for his grace to me in Jesus. If you already have a New Year's resolution and it's not that, can I encourage you to bin it and to adopt this one instead? It's far more important and it will help you with all of the other ones anyway. So, if you are a Christian this morning, here is your New Year's resolution, gift from me. It is this. I'm going to be thankful to God for his grace that Jesus, who was rich, became poor for me so that I, through his poverty, might become rich. Let's pray. Father God, we are so sorry that often we have not been thankful for your grace. And Father, as we think of that ingratitude, we thank you that Jesus died so we can be forgiven. And in the year ahead, we ask that our lives would be marked by great joy because we are just so thankful for what Christ has done. Amen.